Now, who would you identify? Let's say I have a nucleophile. How would you expect a nucleophile to react with this compound? Who would the nucleophile attack? Um, it would attack the, um, I would expect it to attack the uh, carbonyl carbon. You expect the carbonyl carbon to be an electrophile. That's right. There's a couple of different explanations for that. What, what, how can we explain why we'd expect this, carbon, this carbonyl carbon to be electrophilic? Because it has a delta positive, but it also has a resonance for a full positive. That's right. There's another resonance structure where we push these electrons up, and then there's a full positive charge on this carbon. In fact, I'm going to draw that. So that clearly shows that this would be an electrophilic carbon over here. So we know that we always want to try to use resonances in our explanations this okay. term. However, this is not a normal ketone or aldehyde. This is a alpha-beta unsaturated ketone or aldehyde. Alpha-beta unsaturated. So this has another electrophilic carbon. And this, I don't know if you remember this from the video. Terminal carbon? Yeah. What's the best name for this carbon? Because it doesn't have to be terminal. The best name for this is the beta carbon. Because after all, this is the alpha carbon, right? So this would be the beta carbon. The beta carbon in an alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde or ketone is electrophilic. The beta carbon in an alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde or ketone is electrophilic. Did you say unsaturated aldehyde or ketone? Right. We know that aldehydes and ketones usually have similar reactivity. I happen to draw a ketone here, but I could have drawn an aldehyde. So theoretically, a nucleophile could attack either this carbon or this carbon. And we already explained why this carbon is electrophilic. Correct. That makes good sense based on both um, the delta positive and the resonance argument. Do you remember from the videos, though, how can we explain why this carbon is electrophilic? Can we explain why this carbon is electrophilic? Um, well, let's try to use resonance in that explanation. Let's try to draw another resonance structure for this compound. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Essentially, because the pi bond can go between the alpha carbon and the carbonyl carbon. And good. Let's write that. You're on the right track. That's good. Let's use electron pushing arrows to show how to get that other resonance structure. But what you were saying is not as good. We should always use electron pushing arrows to confirm whether a resonance structure makes sense. Good. Good. Let's draw the resonance structure we get from this. Okay, good. The most important thing that there is that you got the charges right. Now, it makes perfect sense to draw a resonance structure where these electrons move here, because the oxygen is more electronegative than the carbon. However, that leaves a gap, and that gap would pull these electrons towards it. Okay. So this makes sense, too. Well, does that give us a reason why this would be electrophilic? Yes, so now we have the reason. This shows why organic chemists love resonance so much. Because if you didn't know about resonance, you could stare at this carbon all day without being able to figure out why it's electrophilic, right? Carbon-carbon right. um, pi bonds are not normally electrophilic. What we learned in a previous term is that normally carbon-carbon pi bonds are nucleophilic. We learned how we can do electrophilic additions to carbon-carbon pi bonds, Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov. There must be something special about this that makes it electrophilic. Uh, and the fact is there's the resonance. Also, the resonance is very cool because it helps us to explain why the beta carbon is electrophilic and not the alpha carbon. Mm -hmm. Because there's a resonance structure where the beta carbon has a positive charge, but there's no resonance structure where the alpha carbon has a positive charge. So the resonance gives us a very neat explanation for why the beta carbon is electrophilic here. But of course, this only is for an alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde or ketone. Yeah. Would this be electrophilic? This carbon, no, because it's not unsaturated, so there is no other resonance structure here. 
There is no resonance structure that puts a positive charge on the carbon here. That's why we never had to talk about this before, even though we've been talking about aldehyde, aldehydes and ketones. We've been talking about aldehydes and ketones, but we haven't been focusing on alpha, beta, unsaturated ones. So we didn't, there, was no, there wasn't anything special about the beta carbon. So it's only in an alpha, beta, unsaturated aldehyde or ketone that the beta carbon is electrophilic. And the more general lesson here is keep trying to use resonance as an explanation in OCHEM. That's the big theme for this term. Well, in a way, that's kind of frustrating because now that makes it harder to predict what's going to happen when we have a nucleophile. Because we have to predict, is the nucleophile going to attack the carbonyl carbon or is it going to attack the beta carbon over here? Uh, first of all, like I said in the other video series, as a kind of rule of thumb, most nucleophiles uh, are going to attack the beta carbon. So if you have to take a guess, you should guess that okay. it's going to attack the beta carbon. I mentioned in the other video series, I mentioned a couple of nucleophiles that would, that would attack the carbonyl carbon. Um, since most nucleophiles attack the beta carbon, you should just memorize the ones that would attack the carbonyl carbon in this case. Um, one of the things I mentioned isn't covered in your lecture notes, so we won't review that again today. Right. The only thing that he mentioned in the lecture notes was alkyl lithiums and Grignards. Yards, both would attack the carbonyl carbon. Those are the only things that it looks like you have to memorize attack the carbonyl carbon. In the other videos, I also mentioned uh, amine derivatives like hydrazine or uh, hydroxyl amine also attack the carbonyl carbon. But it doesn't look like your instructor is covering that, so we'll just focus on these two that attack the carbonyl carbon. Pretty much everything else that you're going to see is going to attack the beta carbon if it's alpha beta unsaturated. I've actually seen some textbooks say that Grignards are complicated, uh, but your textbook isn't saying that Grignards are complicated, it's just saying that Grignards attack the carbonyl. So we'll just learn it that way for your course. So then we would have like, um, we would have uh, category one. Yeah, that's right. We know that um, Grignards and alpha lithiums do a category one attack, so that would form an alcohol after aqueous workup. what's going to happen here. What do you think would happen first here when you're ready?
Now we're going to have to make room for these electrons that are coming in. This is a little complicated. I don't know if you remember from the other videos what other arrow do we need to draw here. Do we have to draw two other arrows? Actually, it's a little bit a matter of taste. Okay. But um, let me show you what I think is going to be best. All right. Let's just do this. Let's just kick these electrons onto the alpha carbon. Okay. Let's draw the product from that.